is Rob. I organize IDEA to IPO. We've been doing events in Silicon Valley for many, many years. We always have a busy, busy calendar of events. I want to highlight two events that are coming up. March the 7th, how to get seed funding for your early stage startup. That's in Palo Alto. Also in Palo Alto, March 21st, we have another venture capital panel, investment and latest innovations in robotics. So check out the details for those events, and all of our events on our website, ideatoipo.com. We launched officially on February 1st, 2010. At that time, we had no members and no events on our calendar. At this stage, we have over 60,000 members among all our meetup groups in the Bay Area. We've completed over 1,998 events. We're the most active, most prolific startup event organization in Silicon Valley, bar none. Bill, what are you laughing at? Uh, your, your, your spontaneous applause. <laughs> all right. Well, let me expand on that. If we're the most active, most prolific startup event organization in Silicon Valley, and Silicon Valley is the global center of entrepreneurship innovation, we are the most active, most prolific startup event organization in the entire world. <laughs> I appreciate your enthusiasm, panel. Spontaneous applause. <laughs> Our mission is to promote entrepreneurship, support entrepreneurs, build community, and provide value in the Silicon Valley startup ecosystem. To that end, we provide content that is practical, actionable, and relevant, stuff that you can actually use to succeed as entrepreneurs. We believe in building community because Silicon Valley is an aspirational ecosystem that attracts people from all over the world who come here to do great things. Who here is not originally from Silicon Valley? Cool. Who here was born and raised in Silicon Valley? All four of you guys. Awesome. <laughs> well, welcome. So whether you were born and raised in Silicon Valley or just arrived last night, it is important for us to provide multiple channels for you to meet people, build relationships, and grow your network. In addition to our content-oriented events throughout the week, we also hold some social events on Friday nights. And they're hosted by one of our team members, CJ Terrell. So let's give it up for CJ. Applause. Hey everyone, good evening. So, uh, Rob mentioned these TGF mixers, so what are they? Uh, they are these really casual, no agenda sort of mixer events. We hold them at the Hyatt Regency in Santa Clara. Our next one's gonna be March 22nd. They are free, and we get a lot of people from around the area, and those who are kind of flying in through the area for business, you name it. Again, no agenda, just kind of getting to know people. We recommend you come out. We always get a really good crowd, and they're gonna be, uh, again, March 22nd, starting at 8 p.m going to 11 p.m. the Hyatt Regency in Santa Clara, which is right across the street from Levi Stadium. Enjoy the event tonight. Talk soon. With regard to value, it is important that we provide value at each and every one of our events. Not just value for your money, which is important, so we make sure our events are affordable. And if you cannot afford the cover charge for whatever reason, come talk to me and we can work something out. And at each and every one of our events, we make sure that we have a delicious buffet meal. Is that a delicious buffet meal? Yes. All right. Well, I think one third of you like it, that's cool. So uh, I would like to acknowledge the sponsor of that delicious buffet meal, that's Royce Law Firm, and this is Royce Law Firm right here. I do wanna ask something real quick. Uh, do you guys have a sense of humor? I haven't used this in a while. Okay, so who likes pizza? Okay, who here is an early stage entrepreneur? Okay, wow. So what's the difference between a pizza and an early stage entrepreneur? A pizza can feed a family of four. <laughs> I got permission ahead of time, right? So at least you guys can laugh about yourself. Don't steal my joke. More importantly though, at each and every one of our events, we want to make sure that we provide value for your time, which is your most valuable resource. Anyone here getting any younger? Besides our panel? <laughs> I didn't think so. So when you invest your valuable time to come to our events, we want to make sure that you maximize your ROI. And we have many, many partners that help us do what we do. Law firms, venture capital firms, angel investor groups, incubators, 
accelerators, colleges, universities, co-working spaces, lots of players in the Silicon Valley startup ecosystem. Tonight, we're grateful to One Piece Work for hosting us at this beautiful venue. Is this a beautiful venue? Yes, yes it's a beautiful venue. So let's hear it for Matt and One Piece Work. Applause. Thank you for the introduction. Um, so as you guys know, you guys are in One Piece Works, Santa Clara. Uh, we do have a few other locations in the Bay Area, San Francisco, San Jose, uh, Palo Alto. If you want to head a little bit more north, Seattle. Uh, Foster City is a brand new location, uh, the Metro Tower, 21st floor, I believe. Um, beautiful building. So if you guys are looking for a space, um, a desk of some sort, that's the place you're going to want to go. Um, One Piece Work in itself is actually a startup. Uh, we're only a couple years old, but we're expanding very quickly and very aggressively. Um, which is a good sign for growth, of course. So I'm very excited to have you guys here tonight. Um, I'll be leaving shortly after this. I would like to talk to you guys, but I got a dinner to catch. Um, but there's a couple of pamphlets around this table over here if you guys want to go ahead and talk about the desks or anything with our director. His email is on the back of that information sheet there, and you guys are welcome to contact him with any questions, comments, concerns, uh, anything like that. So um, welcome to One Piece. Enjoy the event tonight. Hope you guys learned something, and uh, have fun. We have uh, many partners to help us do what we do. A few of these partners are here tonight, uh, in addition to One Piece Work. I'd like to have them also come up and say a few words. For So let's hear it for Mike and CTO 911. Applause. Hello, everyone. My name is Mike. Uh, I'm with CTO 911. Uh, I'm a data scientist and also a CTO. I help companies build software and platforms. So right now, I'm very focused on data science. Um, working on any artificial intelligence, NLP problems, um, and machine learning. So if you have any startup um, problem that you'd like to solve uh, on the technical side or, or hiring side, uh, I'll be glad to talk to you uh, after the event. But, um, but yeah, any question? I've been helping startups build SaaS solutions for you know, more than 20 years. So yeah, uh, I've been coming to the event very often, but um, uh, it's been my first time here uh, at IDS. I type EL here in one piece, so uh, enjoy the event. All right, thank you. All right, next up we have Kafraz from No GPS. Applause. Uh, GPS exists as a single point of failure. If GPS fails, nothing will work. I have solved this problem with my technology called No GPS. Please come and see me. It will open your eyes. It's disruptive technology. Thank you very much. So though our mission here in Silicon Valley is to support entrepreneurs locally, our global mission, though, is to democratize entrepreneurship and innovation all around the world. To that end, we have a robust YouTube channel, youtube.com slash idea to IPO. Go check it out. We have tons of videos there. We've documented and archived many, many of our events. And this rich, valuable content is available on demand anytime, anywhere, totally free of charge. Whether you're in Santa Clara, Palo Alto, San Francisco, Maui, Moscow, or Timbuktu. And our partner in this endeavor is Tim Jeggers of Jeggers Films, one of the top professional videographers in Silicon Valley. So let's hear it for Tim. <laughs> Applause. Thank you, everyone. I don't know if I can follow up replacing GPS. Uh, but yeah, I do multimedia production. My specialty is video. I do photography as well. Uh, if you have any questions about anything related to that, I'd be more than happy to uh, discuss that later. Um, and yeah, I'm going to go ahead and pass it back. Uh, thanks for having us. OK, here's the schedule for the rest of the evening. Our panel will launch into a spirited, entertaining, dynamic, compelling, informative discussion. Right? Set the bar too high. Exactly. <laughs> Uh, and uh, audience members, hold your questions till, until 8 o'clock. At that point, we'll open up to uh, questions from the audience. We're going to have audience members with questions line up here. We're going to use a microphone because we're recording this event <coughs> for our YouTube channel. If at any point in time during the formal program you need to use the restrooms or out that way, you need to grab some more food, go ahead. It's a very informal atmosphere we have here. At this point, 
I want to pass it off to our distinguished moderator. He is one of the top corporate and startup attorneys in Silicon Valley. He is the founder of the Royce Law Firm, and he's everywhere. He's an iconic figure. He's at meetups, he's at conferences, he's at social events, and he is passionate about helping entrepreneurs succeed. So let's give it up for Roger Royce. Right. Thanks, Rob. Thanks for that good introduction. It's half the reason I show up is just to hear him say good things about me. <laughs> well, welcome. Thanks for coming out tonight. My name is Roger Royce. I'm the founder of the Royce Law Firm. We're about 30 lawyers based in, uh, based in Silicon Valley, offices in San Francisco, Los Angeles, now in New York and Beijing as well. And tonight we're going to talk about uh, venture capital funding trends. Now, I've been doing this for a long time uh, with Rob. And uh, bless his heart, he always gives me this long list of questions. And he says, this is what I want you to ask the VCs that we got on the panel. Got to be careful. We don't want to offend them. Got to be, you know, they're, they're sensitive. So he gives me this long list of questions. It's always the same list of questions. <laughs> We're not going to ask those questions tonight. <laughs> I got so much better questions for our panel of VCs tonight. We're, we are going to make this a little more interesting and entertaining than we have in the past. But before we do that, think of it as a reverse shark tank. Before we do that, uh, I think I'd like to let each of you introduce yourselves, say a little bit about who you are, where you're from, and um, what you invest in and what you're interested in and what you're excited about now. And then we'll kind of go into a discussion from there, OK? Starting with you, Anna. Hello. Uh, my name is Anna. I am with Data Collective Bio. Uh, we invest in AgTech and computational life science platforms. Um, so my background is, uh, I come from Kazakhstan a long time ago, but I've been in the U.S. for quite a while. Um, uh, went to HBS and after that joined Monsanto Growth Ventures, where we invested in uh, agriculture. And then our team moved to uh, Data Collective uh, on the bio side to invest in AgTech and computational life science platforms. My name is Nuno Gustav Peter. I'm with Grishin Robotics. We're a Sand Hill Road fund focused on Series A and B investments at the intersection of the physical and digital worlds. Um, because I have too much time on my hands, I also run my own venture firm on weekends called Strive Capital. First fund was focused on mobile apps, investing in companies like App, Annie, Keep Safe, and a bunch of others that you might have heard about. Second fund is really a family office. We do both very early stage investments around deep tech so artificial intelligence, blockchain, but we also invest very late stage uh, around companies that you might have heard of, like Gusto or Rubrik, so very hot enterprise software companies here in the Bay Area. Um, I am originally Portuguese. My name sort of gives me away. And it should be read like Lulu, but with N. So Nunu, not Nuno, Nuno or whatever. Um, and originally, I actually um, am a uh, um, computer engineer by background that was not very good at developing stuff. Became a product manager. Um, unfortunately, was not a product manager here, so probably I'd still be a product manager today. Uh, ended up in China being a senior expert for McKinsey and Company, and then decided to be an entrepreneur in venture capital. If you guys think that being an entrepreneur in a startup is difficult, try and do your own venture capital firm. All right, hi everyone, I'm S.C. Moadi. A uh, very similar background to Nunu. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, electrical engineer, MBA, product background. After I sold my last company, spent a few years at Facebook. And when I left Facebook, was invited to write a book on what makes a great product. As I was writing this book, I realized that every head of product had an interesting perspective on that aspect. And so I started a network, which today is one of the largest networks of product managers in the world called Products That Count. Uh, as an investor, I ran Mighty Capital, my own venture capital fund, which I founded. And the value proposition for the portfolio companies is we give them access to Products That Count, that network of product managers. So it's very attractive if you're hiring product managers, if you're selling to product managers, or if you want to be acquired by a tech company, because most of the time, chief product officers, VP of product are the ones who are initiating an acquisition. We invest later stage series A, B, and C, and mostly in the Bay Area. Hi. So my name is Bill Reichert, and I am 
Managing Director of Garage Technology Ventures. Garage is a seed in early stage venture capital firm. I started out many years ago, many years ago, <laughs> many years ago here in Silicon Valley as an entrepreneur. I started my first software company when I was a grad student at Stanford, before it was fashionable for grad students at Stanford to start software companies. Um, did that a few different times, had two IPOs, and then got together with Guy Kawasaki and a few other people, and we started Garage to be a different kind of venture capital firm. One of our mantras was, we take the FU out of, fun out of funding. So that was <laughs> <laughs> we didn't publish that one very often, but we wanted to be a different kind of venture capital firm. That was the big idea, um, you know, when we started Garage. So we've reinvented Garage four, five, six times or so over the years. Um, now, you know, we were originally, you know, two guys in a garage or two gals in a garage or a guy and a gal, whatever. Now, with the explosion of accelerators, we're cl we categorize ourselves as late seed, which is now what fourth round, fifth round? Is that? <laughs> kind of how the things have gone. So more recently, and we've always been generally technology agnostic, so investing kind of across the spectrum, though we don't do drugs or sex or guns, right? So in drugs, sex, and guns, we don't do. Um, and then more recently, we affiliated with um, a later, pardon? As investments. As investments, right? <laughs> Um, so, which, never mind. So, SC and I. <laughs> so, um, and, was, and more recently, so we affiliated with a, um, a relatively new fund, a global fund called Fenox Venture Capital, um, which is doing corporate venture capital as a service for 25 multinational corporations, mainly out of Asia. So, they do mainly later stage stuff. So, that gave, gives us more reach and powder and depth. But uh, most of our stuff has been, more recently, a lot of our stuff has been in uh, AI. We did, we've done now two quantum computing investments. So I think I might be the number one quantum computing investor in Silicon Valley, or tied for number one, because I think there are only two companies you could possibly invest <laughs> in. Um, but uh, so we like to do deep technology. Um, so that's generally kind of what we've been doing. Cool. Well, let me kind of jump ahead a little bit, <clears throat> and something that's been on my mind, I guess we're, we're about seven years into a five-year cycle now, and I've been hearing from everybody that, you know, the, the worm's going to turn, the shoe's going to drop, the economy's going to, you know, take a downturn and head into the recession, and I've always thought that the, the startup community is sort of the canary in that coal mine. If it happens, it happens here first, and I'm doing two down rounds right now, and I haven't done a down round in a long time. Uh, it's just been up and up and up. So I'm wondering, from your perspective, and by the way, uh, if anybody here, were you around in 2009, you know, 2008? Remember, remember those days? Remember pay to play and washed out and getting squashed and all those things? God, I hope we don't go back to that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, all, all of that stuff. So what do you think? Are you optimistic? Are you bullish or bearish about the future? Are things going to get better? Are they going to go up? Are they going to go down? Is, is my experience unique, or are we at the start of uh, something bad? Well, I, I think – so one of the things that's different this time, I think, um, is what has happened over the last – during the cycle is technology and startups and venture capital has penetrated – Lots and lots and lots of different sectors. And so what's actually happening, I think, and maybe this is not your case, but if you, if you two years ago wanted to raise money as an ed tech venture, you were going to be in trouble. If you wanted to raise today, if you want to raise money as an AR, VR venture, you're going to be in trouble. If you want to raise money to do food delivery, you're going to be in trouble. So we've had all of these sectors appear and go through their hype cycle and so what we're seeing is a more robust, resilient, broad-based economy than we have in prior cycles. You know, where, you know, in the original bubble, anybody here? <laughs> no. In the original bubble, it was, you know, it was, it was, pretty, it was pretty narrow, right? You know, it was all internet. It was, um, so whether it was B2B or B2C, um, it was still pretty much all internet and then everything that supported the internet. This time, it's unbelievably pervasive in terms of all of the different business models and technologies that have evolved. And so I think we're seeing lots of churning across these sectors. 
Um, you know, and then there will be a macro event effect as well, but I'll let the rest of the panelists talk about that. Thank you. Cool. Just <laughs> one. <laughs> Thank you. I was going to take the mic from Bill, but he was first. <laughs> um, okay. So I'm I'm looking at it from a kind of the wh where's the money going? And right now the the stock market is is still doing well. The minute the stock market starts to flounder, what happens is people take their money away from the stock market and they're like, where else do I put my money? And it usually goes into real estate or private equity and, and venture capital. So that's that's the first thing. Like the stock market is, has not yet tipped, which means it, it's actually good news for for investments in venture capital. Second, saying there's still th there's all this money out there, all these mega funds who are you know kind of on the hook for making very very large investments, whether they return them or not, we'll know that in a couple of years. So there's still a couple of years of lots of money out there. Now, locally, I'm, I'm looking at a couple of trends. <coughs> One is there's going to be a lot of companies going IPO this year, Uber, Airbnb, and so on and so forth, which means lots of money, again, flowing through the system, right? So even more funding. And now I'm looking at valuations and what I've seen sort of last year versus this year. And last year, you know, we already thought, oh, everything's overvalued. It's like a 10, maybe a 12x to the to the revenue and now we see a lot of companies who come and pitch us like a uh, valuations in a 20x to the revenue so um, I'm, I'm still very bullish now my prediction on when things are going to turn I think our current administration is going to try to push the economy as strongly as possible through the 2020 elections because that's the political agenda that's going to get them elected and so you know assuming, again, like lots of assumptions, that they have enough control to push that economy up and up and up. We have another kind of 12 to 18 months. After that, you know, whatever happens, happens. I tend to agree with you, Bill, that a lot of the fundamentals of innovation and, and kind of multi-industry are there. So whatever corrections happen, I don't necessarily think it's, think it's going to be a, a major one. So, so, so the micro person in me would like to agree with both of you. But somehow, I think we as venture capitalists always miss the big macro picture and i'm not the right person to talk about it but for sure the fact that there is an ongoing trade war between the two big economies of the world is a big deal and i think it's going to affect us a lot more than we think and we actually had a good place to talk about that for various reasons um i think you know there is overheating in many markets and in some markets even relating to real estate and other markets that you were talking about which normally flow the capital out of equity markets i would say actually if we look at tech potentially there's been already some realignments in public equities i agree uh, it's fascinating to me that there's so many ipos that will happen this year which is really amazing um but then i also would look at players that are really potentially overheating what i would call the private um, IPO market, so to speak, the guys that are coming in earlier and taking in stakes and taking in secondaries and taking capital off the table. And it's sometimes that has to give, right? Um, so again, the micro person in me would totally agree with SC and with Bill. The guy who always misses the macro picture for, for various reasons would say something's going to have to happen at some point. Um, the straight war actually concerns me quite a lot. Um, I think... Uh, well, there are a few things to add. One is, um, I, I think the bigger picture is the right picture to look at. And I think um, if you look even in 2008, people didn't really think it's coming, right? There were only a few people who kind of made the bet, uh, but most of the people were very optimistic it's not gonna come. But if you look at history, it's been always cycles, right? Like up and ups and downs. So the question is more when it's coming. Um, I think it will come. Uh, the question is just the timing. Um, that's uh, number one. In terms of the flow of capital, there's actually a really interesting trend that um, has been happening uh, over the last several years where you see a lot of the capital moving from public markets into private markets. And that definitely drove a lot of the valuations up. So there is a lot more capital available. Um, if a company used to IPO pretty early on, uh, before today companies do that at pretty late stage, um, it, like compare for example Amazon and Facebook you know, uh, the valuation at IPO for uh, both of the companies 
who captured most of the value, uh, public equity investors versus the private uh, equity investors. And when you have that much money uh, and you have all these companies coming, yes, valuations go up. Um, I do see that also uh, in trends for certain industries, like the food industry last year was overhyped. Um, I, I think some of the valuations were really, really um, uh, concerning, I would say. Um, you see that also kind of in the material space. Uh, basically, if you can uh, position your startup as a sexy startup, whether it's AI or it's you know the f new technology in food, uh, people kind of jump in, uh, but then this trends pass. And the question as an investor, it's even if the market is overheated, you still need to invest, right? But you need to find the companies that are good companies that even if the market crashes, they still will survive. Sure, go right ahead. Um, one one important, I think, um, piece of um, advice for all the entrepreneurs in the room, when, when um, like a lot of times we see entrepreneurs come and pitch very high valuations in the situation that you're describing, which is a down round, the first person to get hit by a down round is, is actually you, know, you, the founders. So pushing for really high valuations uh, may not work to your advantage in the next like two, three years because the correction is likely to come by then. You realize your credibility, uh, you know, advocating that entrepreneurs not ask for too high valuations is a little suspect, right? You know, <laughs> the VC is saying, don't but, ask but for I, too <laughs> but I agree, but I agree, Bill, right? Just to be clear and just to make this a bit more exciting, I totally agree because I think sometimes entrepreneurs uh, forget two things. They forget their waterfall, right? There's liquidation preferences, most of the money that you receive. <laughs> and the second thing that you forget is that valuation is baggage. At some time, at some point in time, in the future, you'll need to actually hit the valuation you're going for. And if the valuation that you're given, you don't think you'll hit in the next three years or four years, well, good luck, right? So, yeah, unless it's a Ponzi scheme or something, which it's also right. very okay, good. So let's talk about Uber then. I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll back up my, my, my thesis to, to uh, continue the controversy. So why does it matter, right? I'll, I, the example I use is really simple. Uh, my, my husband loves motorbikes. He, he buys like Ducati bikes, super expensive. Now, the, the price of the, the, you know, of the bike on the sticker, right, it's like a certain price. And then the price when you get out the door, it, it's a much, much higher price because you buy a bundle with maintenance and some loans and so on and so forth. So that's called the difference between list price or valuation and total cost of ownership or terms, right? So investors, when they invest in your company at whatever valuation you know, is agreed to, they have a certain amount of terms that they invest in, including liquidation preferences, right? So they protect themselves. Uh, and, and the entrepreneur don't necessarily have that kind of protection, which is why it's so important to have fair valuation wh when you hit, you know, if and when you hit a down round. <coughs> Yeah, you said a mouthful there. It's not all about valuation, is it? It's all the other terms, liquidation preferences, uh, the anti-dilution protection, the redemption rights. Said the lawyer, right? <laughs> it's highly complex, highly complex. You really need, no, yeah, I'm, 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 I, actually that is a legitimate and serious point. Make sure you have uh, good advice. Make sure you have good advice. And we see all t too many entrepreneurs who don't have good advice. But to your original point, uh, Roger, I'd be interested to hear what, what the panel thinks the, the market cap of Uber will be at the end of 2019. There's an indication of optimism or, well, you know, of your point of view on the world. So people are saying, you know, so Uber is in the 70s right now, something like that, and people are saying that it might go out, it might go out, it could go out at 120 billion. So, you know, sometimes you got a long period of time before you actually have to justify your valuation. <laughs> but what do you guys, I mean, do you guys have a point of view on, on I don't mean to take your questions. You Roger, want to stand up here? Do you have a I'll, I'll just, I'll just, no, what go do ahead. You, I mean, what do you, curious what do you, now are, myself. are you guys, are you paying attention? Do you think, do you think Uber is going to be 120 or 20? Um, I think, well, I definitely think it's not going to, you know, triple or quadruple. Uh, over a year, um, I don't know. It's a it's a tough question, um, but um, I think it's gonna stay about the same. Um, but I I don't think it's gonna grow a lot more. I, I'll I'll answer that by doing a comparison between Uber and Airbnb. 
Uh, we're investors in Airbnb, which there's a good reason, Airbnb versus Uber. Uh, what we see is in the, in the sharing economy, when you, when you get an asset, right, when it's a house versus a car, right, a house, if you, um, if you think of does the value of a house appreciate or depreciate over time, generally you think it's going to appreciate, right? You make a real estate investment because you think the value of your house is going to appreciate. And if you, for example, buy a house that's like a little bigger, right, with an extra room that you can rent on Airbnb, the value of the house over time is going to even further uh, you know, appreciate because it's, it's a bigger house. On the other hand, the value of a car over time, you tend to think it's going to depreciate, right? So if you buy a car to, to drive it with Uber, it's going to depreciate faster than if you don't drive Uber, right? So the use of the asset is in one situation to the benefit of the, the person who, who ha owns the asset. And on the other hand, it's to the detriment of the person who owns the asset. And that tells you a lot about how I think about the value of Airbnb over time versus Uber over time. Because if you're... But how about the value of Apple? Let's go up or down? <laughs> <laughs> One question at a time. I want to finish my train of thought. <laughs> <All right>. <laughs> 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 So, so, you know, I if you think of like the, the value of a company like Airbnb, it's kind of creating this virtuous cycle of if I buy a bigger house so that I can rent it on Airbnb, I'm going to build wealth for myself. Versus an Uber driver who says, I'm going to buy a car, it's going to get used faster, so I'm going to have to buy a car more often, and then I need to make more money. Do I make more money when I drive with Uber? Well, right now there's a big question around that because of the margins, and you guys probably get that uh, you know, understanding, like how much the driver gets paid plus how much Uber gets plus how much the government gets in taxes equals the price, and there's sort of pressure on both sides, right? So, value of Airbnb, I would say, totally bullish that it's going to like go three, five x. Value of, of Uber, it's sort of like, well, it, it definitely has a cap to it. The problem is if you put the cap too low, then you know. Every other startup company is going to like devaluate with Uber because Uber is kind of this poster child. So it's a very controversial uh, valuation. I, I'll, I'll add a little bit. Um, so the public equity investors think in a very different way from uh, private investors, and they're a lot more focused on financials, uh, the way you do reporting how diligent you are. And I'm not sure what the management is and if they run the numbers well, uh, but uh, you know, hedge fund uh, investors or mutual funds, they really, really focus on the trends, the margins, the growth. If it's growing but decelerating, that's a really bad sign for a tech company. That will cause shorting the stock. And so if you see that trend, that will send the stock down. Um, and then if you think about, you know, Uber, like what are the other geographies they can expand to? Is there more potential for growth? Those are the kind of questions you should think uh, when you think of, you know, investing. But I, but I think we're fundamentally, so, so the, the real answer is nobody knows, right? Um, certainly not. <laughs> well, it's, it's be, no, I, I, I mean, I, I, I would like to think that they're going to be up valuation on IPO, otherwise they would probably wouldn't do it. They're not that silly, right? Because they're going to have lockups for six months to 12 months. So I'd suspect they know there's some upside there. But, but anyway, nobody knows. I think also because at the end we don't know, and this is part of our thesis at Christian Robotics, we don't know what's happening in personal mobility at the end, right? We're seeing several early signs that things are going to change very dramatically. Um, you know, with bike and scooter sharing for last mile or two mile and three mile radius, that's a big deal. Uber's manifested and has made acquisitions in that space, right? Uh, we don't know what's going to happen with self-driving vehicles or when it's going to happen. Is it in five years? Is it in 10 years, right? Is it going to be really uh, urban-focused technology? Is it not going to be an urban-focused technology? How is it going to manifest itself? So in some ways, I think it's interesting that Uber got to the valuation they got so fast. And I think that was your point, Bill, which is it was probably very overvalued very early on. And in some ways, everyone was piling on it and they forgot basic principles like these guys are not in many markets anymore, to your point, right? You know, they exit Southeast Asia through a reverse merger with, uh, with Grab. 
they, you know, exited Russia, right? They exited China. So, you know, effectively, they said this is going to be global. It's no longer global, that story. They have competition from Lyft in the U.S. So I think all of that is absolutely true. But in some ways, it's very difficult to know what's going to be the future. One thing we know for sure, Zen Zers are getting less and less cars. They're driving less and less, right? So that we know. So we know that the use cases are changing. We, uh, we know that the cities that we have in the U.S. today are not well prepared for whatever we're doing to them, including cars, including with Uber. We felt that in San Francisco for sure. So I think it just, I, I would see a lot of variables. I'd be very shocked if they IPO and they don't go bump up. I, I would bring agree to that and, and add that if I'm trying to, sorry, I couldn't see you over there you're with all the heads. <laughs> uh, um, if, if I'm going to make a kind of a long-term projection, um, I'm going to take the, um, the, the theory that it's going to follow the, the pattern that, for example, the Zillow Group has established uh, or even Facebook has established, which is it's going to become a conglomerate of sort of my, you know, slightly similar competitors, just like you know, Zillow owns Zillow plus Trulia plus some you know smaller brands, and Facebook owns Facebook the app plus Instagram plus WhatsApp. I would imagine that Uber, as sort of the the gorilla in the category, may acquire Lyft and you know do scooters and stuff like that as sort of a, a, a conglomerate of ride sharing services. Um, your, your point is well taken that what happens in China affects the markets here. What happens to Uber is going to affect valuations. So I want to bring this back to a little more early stage. Um, I suspect a large, this is a big group, by the way, and looking around, I suspect that a large part of this group is raising money. And um, one of you had, had mentioned that there's a lot of different sources of capital these days. Two years ago, I remember we did a panel, and somebody asked Bill Reichert about crowdfunding, and he gave it his opinion. It wasn't favorable. Um, I think it was about a year ago I was on a panel, and somebody asked about ICOs, and the VCs on the panel didn't like that. Uh, this year, STOs are all the rage, security token offerings. Um, what do you think about that? Because almost every company I see, well, number one, what do you think about that? And is that competitive with your industry? Is it healthy for your industry? Is it good for the startups? Is it good for the ecosystem generally? STOs, S specifically? Generally, tokens, crowdfunding, alternative I, capital. Uh, look, I, uh, I don't invest in tokens. I, I have invested in blockchain plays in equity or, or notes that convert into equity. I don't invest in tokens for reasons that have nothing to do with tokens. They just have to do with our mandate as an investor. Um, I think, you know, STOs are just then a super reverse engineered thing, right? Because there's a securitization of the token, which is like magically that matches regulation. Nice. But isn't that the security as well? Um, but again, you are the lawyer, so I don't know much about this stuff. So um, for me, um, I think having more sources of funding for entrepreneurs is good, but it never solves the gaps for scaling. The big capital will need to come in at some point in time. And even if you have a lot more corporate venture capital arms in the market, which we know there are, even if we know that the hedge funds are coming earlier and earlier, which we know they are, even if we know there are now mega, mega funds, which we know there are, at some point, you're going to need capital from other sources, right? And so diversity of sources and institutional investors in some way, be it corporates, be it you know VCs, be it growth funds, be it private equity funds, be it who it be, you will need them at some point, right? Unless magically something happens. And so I have nothing against STOs. I have nothing against crowdfunding. I have nothing against ICOs. But I do think it's horses for courses, right? And I think you as entrepreneurs need to understand what you're signing up for. One thing, and I've gone uh, through two ICOs as a board member, one thing that we kept telling entrepreneurs is you need to understand that after you do your ICO, you are a public company, right? It might be a utility token. It might be something else. You're public. Your value is going to go up and down. Your Telegram chat group is going to matter a lot, right? You're going to have to resource stuff to make that work. And I think a lot of people that raise a lot of capital in ICOs, and that's why maybe we're not seeing a huge bang in blockchain companies right now, because there's a lot of capital that actually hasn't been deployed yet. They raised it. Some of them were smart enough to take it into fiat pretty quickly, but it's not being deployed yet. So at the end of the day, I think the key thing is what are you getting out of it? Are you getting some value for your capital? Are you getting some support of your investors or not? You know, what are the strings attached to the money you've raised? I mean, just understanding and having full visibility on it, I think, is the key thing. Just getting capital 
always has a cost. We've talked about it earlier, right? Waterfalls, all the stuff that nasty investors do to you, they will also do to you on ICOs. They will also do to you in many other forms, and STOs, and et cetera. So again, just know what you're signing up for. I have no problem that there's more sources of funding. I think it's great. I'll, I'll add to this that um, yeah, I, I do uh, believe that the blockchain ecosystem is, a, just like uh, Nunu said, <laughs> a great source of, um, of funding that ecosystem-based venture capital is, is sort of the next generation of venture capital. I think it's uh, a little too early for us to, to consider blockchain investments. I would characterize what happened in like the 2012, 2013 as the, the uh, Friendster era of, uh, of blockchain, what's happening right now as like the MySpace era, and we're waiting for the Facebook era to make our investments. And you, but you think it will become a Absolutely. Facebook? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Blockchain or tokenization? You, blockchain. Secure. You're saying blockchain, blockchain right? Yeah. So I'm, I'm going to sort of um, try to reground everyone in reality here, right? So this is what, you know, the, the, the wise old VC taught me when I was a lad, right? Growing up here in, uh, in Silicon Valley, which is, yes, I mean, so. The, all these new sources of capital are actually quite brilliant for entrepreneurs, and, and so I'm not dissing them at all. You know, I think possibly, you know, one of the one of one of the most valuable innovations was Kickstarter. Um, you know, for for consumer oriented or directed products, it was a brilliant it, it was a brilliant way to get out there. You know, without getting into the securities problem, but fundamentally, 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 the best source of funding is customers, 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 customers. And the reality is because you never know when the market's going to turn. You never know kind of how things are going to go. It, it, it always behooves you as an entrepreneur. If you can, you can't always. Sometimes you're swinging the fence, you don't have a choice. But if you can get in control of your destiny by getting to you know, the ability to be cash flow break even, you know, it's, it's, I tell you having, you know, as an entrepreneur several times, as a board member many times, the, just the whole psychology of a company when you know that you're in control of your future changes dramatically. As opposed to the psychology when you know you're going to run, you know you're going to run out of money. It's just horrible, horrible psychology. So, yeah, you know, just a little plug for a traditional source of funding. Uh, I'll just add one point. Um, I think uh, if you look at uh, uh, funds that kind of give more uh, token money versus traditional equity, those are different type of investors. And I think it's hard enough for you to deal with one investor, with one type of investor, then you have to deal with two different types of investors. And um, maybe it depends on how much money you raise from every source, but I think just operationally it becomes more challenging. Uh, I have some friends who approach me and ask me, oh, how do I pitch uh, this investor versus that? And I was like, well, equity investors think differently. You can pitch these ideas to them. Um, th the way you present data is very different. Like all these little things. Um, so I would really think twice before going to two different. Anna, is that true of corporate venture capital too? You think, or they, they think differently? Corporate, um, I think it depends depends on the corporate VC. So I was at Monsanto Growth Ventures before. We were very much like a traditional venture fund. Um, the approval process is different. It's slower. There are pluses, minuses. I, it is slower in the process, but the upside is you can get a client. Like Monsanto would very often do POCs with the companies that you know we invested in, or they would do it even before we invested in them. Um, so I think it's more like traditional, but ICO is a very different process. But for me, the question would be, actually, the more interesting question would be, is there going to be disruption to the venture capital value chain or not? And for me, that is quite cool because I think this is a pretty 
actually stale value chain, right? I mean, we just have different players that keep moving back and forth with capital. Uh, it's been really cool to have angels coming in and also participating in the risk taking. What I think a lot of the angels are, or sort of smaller angels rather than institutional angels. There's some actually very good institutional angels, super angel funds out there. There's a lot of great micro venture firms out there, etc. But what a lot of the basic, you know, smaller check angels don't understand is they're feeding a system that doesn't reward them in any way, shape, or form uh, that just creates a sherry pickings market for VC funds at Series C and Series A. Um, you know, in, in some cases, they even then, and pardon me for my English, get screwed then, right? Because you have VC funds who come in and said, yeah, now you're going to convert to common. Or I don't want you in the cap table, you have too many people, et cetera, et cetera. So for me, the real cool question is, you know, will there be disruption in VC and how will that disruption happen? You, you know, on that, so, so, so related, I mean, is the VC community going to embrace tokens ever? For example, in your term sheets, do you have a provision that you get an allocation of tokens if the company does an ICO? Do you do that? I've been seeing that a lot. Um, we are not doing it right now um, because we have some limitations in any case in taking tokens in our LP agreements. Um, but, but I think for me, the point on this, it's not even just the level of securitization or the sources of capital, is how VC is done. This is a market that has been dominated by significant players that are tier one, by the appearance once in a while of players that come into the market and become tier two players through a lot of branding and push. You know, um, uh, and I do predict there will be another very visible fund this year, probably not a tier one, but probably a very brand visible fund that will implode again this year, right? And we've seen a few in the last few years and it will implode again because of partnerships, right? Because this is a partnership business with people being married for very long-term relationships, probably more married than with their wives in some cases. Um, and so, exactly, and husbands as well, sorry, <laughs> and husbands as well. Um, and so, um, in, in, in some effects for me, the cool, cool part is it's a market that's dominated still by inbound deal flow, networking driven deal flow, large sources of capital, the big guys always raise more money, the brands matter, you get some specialisms coming in once in a while, some work out, some don't. So. I think that's ready for the picking. I think it is time to do stuff that's actually different. Um, and you know, maybe that's the big disruption that will happen in this space. Other comments? Bill? Just well, I, I, you know, every cycle the the disruption of the of the industry is predicted, and every cycle there's some, some significant innovation in the industry. You know, the angels, the accelerators. Now, you know. Corporates keep on coming in and out, and then a few other innovations. So you're partnering with a corporate now, you said earlier, yeah. right? Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, so it's, uh, but it's. I think it's a broadening of the ecosystem, not a competition uh, between two alternative futures. You know, it's not a Hegelian sort of one side wins or doesn't. It's a broadening of the ecosystem. That's what we've seen for as long as I've been in Silicon Valley. And so I think it's all good. I think it's all good. I mean, there will be ups and downs in different sectors and classes and categories. And hopefully there will be some more innovation. I'm not sure. I mean, we've been trying forever to create a, you know, sort of a, 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 an OTC public market for smaller companies. You know, people keep on trying to figure that one out. And nobody's figured it out yet. Um, I don't know if it necessarily would help or be good. But um, it does feel as though maybe somebody would invent that. But it's not a, I mean, it's not a novel concept. People have tried. I don't know if anybody, if something's going to switch such, such that it becomes possible. Um, but I'm not worried about the disruption of the industry. And I'm confident there will be novel innovation. And I'm confident that there will be cycles. But I think the fundamental structure of, of private equity venture capital is going to be remain more or less the way it has been. Right. Uh, oh. I just wanted to add also, I, I think when I first kind of uh, thought about ICOs, what I thought was interesting about it from purely the um, fundraising perspective is the ability of any other person to come in and invest in a private company. So this is where I kind of, um, align with Nuno uh, on, it, it's a very interesting concept that, uh, and if we think about the flow of capital now more like shifting to the private side, I think more people want to invest, but it's really hard for you to invest unless you have VC or UNLP, but basically usually means you have to put 
uh, at least 100K, right? Like, if you're thinking of uh, pre-seed or seed, I mean, yes, there are angel investors, but if you're thinking, oh, I want to get into B round, you're not going to be able to do that as a person. Uh, so if there is a tool that can allow you to do that, I think that's a very interesting idea. But I think there's a lot of regulation, a lot of complication, how VCs will react to that as well. Uh, because yes, to the point, uh, VCs do not like very crowded cap tables because it makes life very complicated, especially if you think who has the rights, um, how's the decisions uh, are being made. All of those things are very important. But so, so on that, if, if you saw a company that had done like a reg CF and they've got a thousand shareholders on common stockholders on their table, would you? Well, not a thousand. It'd be public then. Say they got a couple hundred. Would you invest in them? Well, so. I think if you do it first time, it's very risky. You don't know what's going to happen. But if I think, yes, of public equity, sure. I mean, there are like millions of investors and you do it, but they don't usually have a lot of uh, voting rights, right? Or your voice is so small that it's probably not going to move the needle. Um, but I mean, personally, if I thought uh, that it was a really great company, sure, I think I would personally, I would get in. I want to. I want to add. Uh, I agree with Bill on the you know the, the trend and whether your venture and private equity is going to get disrupted. I think about it again, just like Zillow, right? When Zillow started, they said, "Hey, there's this very illiquid market, which is real estate, where basically the real estate agents are creating a, a, a wall, right? Are building a wall between the buyers and the sellers." Uh, using this MLS, right, the, the the listings, and they're they're basically hiding, you know, the buyers from the sellers. So we Zillow or we Trulia are coming in, and we're going to expose that to everybody. So we're going to disintermediate this market. And what happened in, in you know over the course of years is they are actually they actually have not disintermediated the market. Their biggest customers are the real estate agents who now are able to transact much more transparently and much more easily using tools like Zillow and Trulia. And so what I'm seeing a very possible disruptive impact of a blockchain is they're going to become tools used by venture capitalists, private equity, investment banks to transact much more easily on sort of any sort of financing, and they're going to blur the line between private and public markets, but they're not going to displace these investors. Which is actually happening in other industries. For example, shipping, agriculture, you see blockchain being used by the major players. You say you see that happening in venture capital someday. Yeah. Um, so we got about 10, go ahead, Bill. No, no, no. So I, I, I do want to get to some sort of traditional things. We're, we're all kind of wondering, what are you excited about? What industries? I mean, you talked a little bit about what you invest in, but tips for our audience here. I think we got a lot of entrepreneurs who are looking for the next big thing, want to know where to invest their efforts. So if they plan on being a VC-funded company someday, uh, well, two things. What, what's a, what do you think is a real hot area? I like quantum mechanics. I, that sounds cool. Um, and what other advice would you have for our I, audience? I, I think um, the, the, the focus that we have around physicality, the fact that the physical world needs to change at the pace of the digital world, that the metaphors we have in the physical world are fundamentally flawed. They're, they're wrong for the digital world we're going into. I, I always give the same stupid example around self-driving cars, which is, you know, if you're driving your own car and if you like driving cars, you like to feel the road, that probably is more like, you know, a German car, right? Stiffer suspension, et cetera. If you're being driven in a car, you want it to be sort of like an office or, you know, a place where you can rest rather than actually feel the bumps. So you want something that's the opposite. And, and in some ways, I think doing things around consumer use cases and physicality is pretty cool. It doesn't sound very cool because everyone said, but that's like super capital intensive. It's not very agile if there's hardware being defined, et cetera, but I think there's a lot of disruption happening there and that's sort of the whole thesis of what we're doing at Christian Robotics. It's really around you know, that disruption and what's happening there, so very excited about that. Uh, very excited about what I call the app economy around artificial intelligence. I think we now have a bunch of platforms that are out there that can be readily used, you know, TensorFlow and others. And, you know, I think we're going to see the emergence of really cool apps around it that ha still have a little bit of what I would call algorithmic prowess into it. Um, and I think, you know, that's for me the next app economy. I wrote the previous app economy, so I hope I'll write this one as well. Um, and, and that's pretty exciting. Um, so for me, those would be two topics that I, I get super excited about. 
Yeah. Um, so I think, you know, for, for entrepreneurs, the, the cool thing about the way the ecosystem has evolved is that you don't have to figure out what the next big thing is. And I think the reality is you're better served figuring out some small thing, believe it or not, <laughs> find some white space where you can do something that it is really hard for anybody else to do, or you can do something that's something better than anybody else can easily do, and get yourself, you know, a toe hole, a toe hold in a space where you can have a successful company, because you know, un, you know, as one VC said, lean is for losers. In other words, the way the market has evolved now. You know, all of the big, I mean, all of the heat, all the hot companies are hot because they're raising not millions of dollars, not tens of millions of dollars. They're raising hundreds of millions of dollars. And the chance that you're going to get to play in that game is very, very, very low. And so what I'm suggesting is find a niche. Find something that you can do super well. Because right now there's almost no market on, there's almost nothing that is too small a market. You never have to do a market size slide again because there's no market that is too small. Now you've got to understand the market, you've got to, you've got to really understand that market and, and then you want to own that market. And almost any market you can think of is going to be big enough to build a real interesting business. Now, maybe not a soft bank interesting business, but for 90% of the VCs, an interesting enough business, which gives you the opportunity maybe then to extend that to a bigger business. So that's my sort of general, sort of that's the interesting stuff for us. I'll, um, I, I generally uh, agree with, with Bill again on, on this one, and the reason. Well, there must be something. You disagree. And and I'll add to it. I'll add to it. Um, if you are able to create a sustainable, capital efficient niche business, then your chances of being acquired by the behemoth, like the, if you're like a canopy and you get acquired by the WeWork, are are pretty strong because a WeWork is on the hook to deliver so much growth that it's very unlikely they'll be able to deliver it organically. They're going to have to do some mergers and acquisitions of niche markets in order to deliver on their growth expectations. And so if you're able to create a sustainable you know, niche version of WeWork, your chances of being acquired by a, a WeWork who has tons of money are, are you know, uh, pretty good odds, and and that's a good way to be a successful entrepreneur, make some good money. I, it might even be a better way than to be we work, <laughs> if you want to make money as an entrepreneur. Um, and then the the uh, other thing I will add uh, to to Nuno's point, I believe there are if you're in tech, B two B tech, a ton of opportunities in in AI. I know it's a buzzword, but the reason is we have ten years worth of creating data from having a mobile phone, right? GPS and so on and so forth, and and it's so much that we don't know what to do with it. If you find a smart way to use that data, which means if you use AI to create value, then you have a possibly a very interesting business. The other area where I see some real strong potential is, is another platform is genomics. So I think of mobile as a body of data that's outside of us, right? It's like whatever is around us about, you know, our friends, our en environment, our calendar, and so on and so forth. Genomics is the body of data that's inside of us. It's even bigger than the mobile body of data. And, and it, it's almost unused, right? So if you have a, a background in life sciences and you have a co-founder who has a background in technology and you two can get along, that's a potential for some pretty serious uh, innovation and value creation. You get the last word. Yeah, um, so two minutes, okay. Um, on genomics side, so we invest obviously in uh, life science uh, and intersection with compute. So a lot of the things within that space that we you know, see that we get excited about um, is delivery uh, uh, for uh, gene editing. It's still uh, an unsolved problem. Um, especially if you think of targeting delivery to a particular organ or part of the body. Uh, so we're always um, happy to see companies 
that are solving problems in that area. I think also I would think of, I think in this world today we have so much stuff that we don't really need, but it, it's kind of you know uh, taking the the space or it's more like entertainment pro um, um, product. Um, I would encourage to uh, create something meaningful. Um, data collective, we often think about future, uh, even things like global warming, other companies that are actually doing something about it. Uh, the, the, we look into some companies that basically make materials of food made of fungi, and during that process is actually negative CO2, which is good for the environment, and so there's that angle uh, of sustainability, but it's not just sustainability because it's a sexy buzzword, it's actually, you know, it's doing something good for the environment. Okay, Rob, I'm going to turn it back to you. All right, well, let's hear it for the panel. So we're going to open it up to questions from the audience. We have about 30 minutes. We want to take as many questions as possible. So who has a question for the panel? Uh, Roger used it up. <laughs> yeah, I know it requires a lot of courage to give first money, and it requires a lot of homework to make an informed decision. That's why I don't see many seed funding people, you know. Is it because of the laziness or because of the lack of courage? <laughs> because I know Bill, four years ago, I, he used to say that I am a seed funder. Now he says I'm late seed funder. So that's what I have changed. I've seen the change. So that's what I see all the time. People say, oh, series A, because other persons have done homework already. So it's safe to give money. Well, let me assure you, it's never safe to invest <laughs> in an early stage company. I don't care if it's Series B, it's never safe, right? But um, no, I think what's happened in the system is the institutional funds have, you know, have, are now, there's, there's so many startups out there that if, if we have a choice between two guys in a garage with a really clever idea, and you know, ten people with you know a product that's in the market in beta with <coughs> a bunch of customers that you know. So it's that's it's just the challenge. It's the challenge for entrepreneurs that for institutional in investors who are writing somewhat bigger checks, you know, we have a choice to uh, we have the opportunity to invest in these companies that have more validation. And there is, you know, such a huge number of companies. The good news for you, the good news for you is there are so many sources of money that are not even dependent upon you having to prove that you have a viable business. I mean, i.e., if you've got a really clever idea or clever background or some, some other angle, somewhere on in the U.S. or on the planet, there's an accelerator that will give you fifty to $100,000 to prove that you've got something worthwhile. So there's so many sources of money like that out there that are creating all these companies that are competing for our attention when we're writing small checks. I, I fully agree with, with what Bill said, and I think in some ways this is a market where the risk profile changes, right? And so you have you start having series seed, and then you start having pre-seed, and then you have friends and family, and then you have angel in between friends and family and pre-seed. And so you have like a granularization of the seeds of round, which is a little bit your comment and your joke earlier, like we're now fifth round coming in at, uh, at post-seed. Um, so the risk changes, right? But the reason why it actually changes is something that sometimes we do forget. The cost of developing technology goes down it systematically goes down. And in certain areas, it goes down really, really fast, right? I remember in the mobile space, it was a couple of million to develop a mobile app early on, and then it was hundreds of thousands, and then it was tens of thousands, right? And we're talking about version one type stuff, not just an MVP. 
that changes dramatically the game. I think in hardware, we're still seeing a different curve, but I think that curve is actually accelerating really, really fast. And so in some ways, you actually need less capital. And it's not about being lean or not, it's you need less capital, and at that point in time, your friends and family might be able to fund you, right? Shockingly enough. People that actually know you that would take that leap of faith in that first moment of, I want to do this, I want to have the pain of being an entrepreneur, they might be there for you. So in some ways, I think the cost piece is the part where you always have a big advantage. I'll, I'll add that the, the creation and emergence of accelerators, it's, it's good and bad for, for entrepreneurs. Uh, the, the, the reason it's, it's great is it, it spreads best practices, right? It, it helps everybody in the entrepreneur community be more educated about like how do you gain early traction, how do you convert you know, customers, how do you raise some money, and so on and so forth. If you compare that with uh, the landscape for investors, it's actually pretty abysmal, right? So entrepreneurs have gotten really organized. Investors, if you look at the sort of the very early, you know, angel and so on, uh, it's actually very, very hard for them to learn how to be a good investor, is for, uh, investor versus you, you have ways to learn how to be a good entrepreneur. So that's great, right? On the other hand, the the risks of of this whole accelerator um, trend is that you join an accelerator. If you don't join the right one, you're going to give away a significant portion of equity for a very limited amount of value. And so it's not going to get you exactly where you need to get money from like a, you know, a post seed. So you're going to have to join another accelerator to help you get to that you know, next level. And by then you give away a pretty meaningful amount of your equity. And by the time you do that, if you try to raise money from an institutional investor, it may be very hard for them to take a piece of the pie and leave you as the founder a big enough piece that is going to be meaningful for you to continue to stay involved. And so it's great that you have accelerators because they uh, educate you. It, it sort of fast tracks that. But you want to be very careful which one you choose, uh, not to do too many, because otherwise it kind of creates problems for you down the road. Uh, I'll add a few things. One, um I would say the, the rounds have shifted, so seeds are kind of now Series A, and that's why when you hear people more saying we invest in Series A, that's what used to be a seed. Uh, it's more of just that shift. People still invest in early, but they, yes, VCs like to see validation. Um, so it's more of just like technicality. And two, um, there's a difference between investing in business and investing in a project. Uh, and very often, if you that early on, people don't like a lot of people don't think about their product as a business, and they think more of it. Oh, this is a great project. It's interesting, especially if you're more like a uh, science person who gets super excited about something. You do something, and yes, it's amazing. But what are the applications? How are you gonna actually make money on it? Uh, th that's something that VCs also want to see. And if you come to, to me and just say, I have this great idea, it's amazing. I may totally support you as a person, but making that investment, I need to see what is the path for it, uh, growth uh, and you know, liquid liquidation at some point. Hi. Well, I'm a startup founder and I haven't, uh, uh, I'm actually relatively new to the Silicon Valley. We moved here from Europe last year, and I'm making some experiences with fellow investors who are your actually brothers and sisters. Uh, the thing is, uh, being an inter international entrepreneur, and then also in today's world where you can actually work across the globe, you, you can have people, and then you can also operate in various markets. So the DNA is already that we can grow in multiple markets from day one. So we are now speaking to investors here in the Silicon Valley, and uh, most of the investors still are, uh, I would say, stuck to the old thought, no, you should grow in one market, and then once you are standing on this market on your feet, then you can focus on the other markets. So don't you think uh, you should have you know, some kind of a paradigm shift in your thinking that this is the next big thing in order to grow the company. So rather than looking for a next big thing idea, the existing companies can grow very quickly if they can focus on uh, actually growing in multiple markets from day one. I, I think there's two, there's two questions I would unpack. One is 
where are your resources? Where is your center of gravity in terms of team, technology resources, et cetera? And I think what I'm seeing is there's more and more openness in Silicon Valley towards that. So the old model of you need to be within 30 miles of me, I need to be able to have breakfast with you every week, et cetera, in some ways has changed already a bit. There's a lot of openness to having resources in other parts of the world, not just because of cost, but because it's generally almost impossible at times to hire certain types of talent here. You can't get them, right? They're getting you know, hoarded by other players in the market that have a lot of capital to put at the table to go and get those people and then put some beautiful gold handcuffs around their arms and just leave them there, right? Um, and there's nothing wrong with that. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. But, you know, so from that standpoint, I think the Bay Area is becoming more and more open to having resources distributed. The item around market is a different discussion, right? Because if you're going after a market, you're going to have very different markets around the world to go after, right? There are very few truly global platforms that you can ride as a business. Very, very few. Even if you told me the internet or mobile app stores, whatever, even those, they're not really truly global because habits change from market to market. People have different preferences, etc. So how you market your product, how you sell it, how you go to market, does matter which markets you're targeting. And, and that, I think, is always something that's going to be around. And, and from the perspective of a Silicon Valley investor, I wrote about this several years ago, an article called The Myths of the Bay Area, right? There's this notion that there's this huge pool of capital in the Bay Area, and anyone from the world can come here and magically take that pot of gold and go back, right? Why doesn't this work? Well, it doesn't work because if I went to Europe, to Berlin, or if I went to India, to Delhi, and I tried to raise money, and I said, I'm a Silicon Valley investor, I'm a Silicon Valley startup, et cetera, people will be like, what are you doing in our market that we understand as investors? Right? And here it's the same thing. What are you doing in our US market that we understand as investors? So, so in some ways, I think this mythology needs to disappear, which is the capital that is here is capital that is here to serve the markets that we understand. And we understand these markets. On resources, I think, again, the openness of having resources from all around the world is there. I see even openness to highly liquid teams, which I still have a lot of doubts around, highly distributed teams. I still believe in the hub model a little bit more. Um, but I think the whole notion of market focus is pretty important to any investor around the world. And here is no different. No, on a related point, would, would you guys invest in a company that's not based here, whose management team is in a, diff yes, a different... Yes, my first investment is Thrive IPO in two and a half years, Japanese company, took a stock exchange. Uh, one of the superstars of my first fund is a company called AppAnnie, which now everyone knows because they're the mobile analytics guys. Uh, and everyone thinks they're a San Francisco startup. They actually are not. They started in Beijing. They were a Hong Kong company when we invested. They were still a Hong Kong company when Sequoia invested. Uh, and then at some point, they actually became an American company for reasons that had nothing to do with investors. Uh, but you know, again, even in that point, this market that we invested in, a lot of their customers were in the US. So they knew the metrics they looked at. And you know, when the Sequoia looks at it, and when other investors in the US looked at it, they said, okay, these guys have a market in the US. It does not really matter to me that their team is really in China. Do the rest of you feel that way? Because that's a little different than what I would have expected. Well, for our, for our seed investments, they've pretty much, well, so we're pretty, we have been probably two thirds West Coast. Um, and one third, you you know, the red, very few outside the U.S. We've done several in Israel, a few in Canada, right? Um, but that's you know, we are heavily biased seed. You know, working with Fenox, um, they're very global, so they're investing all over the place. So um, you know, Israel, Europe, Asia, South a Southeast Asia, you know, Taiwan, Japan, all over the place. I would say so. The, when you invest in a company, you don't just provide funding, right? You provide other things, resources, you help companies, you work with them. So if a company is located very far, it's really hard to maintain that close relationship. Um, then other countries have very different regulations and the laws, and it may slow down processes. It may prevent certain things. We had, uh, once we invested in a company in Spain, and we actually had to fly to Spain because, uh, you know, th there were certain regulations that made us, we couldn't sign certain things online or via email. We had to actually be present in a room. 
and and you know we in San Francisco if we have to fly for every company for every board meeting it or not even a board meeting it, it just complicates the process a lot more um, so we invest mostly in the US but we have also companies in Canada uh, previously we invested in South uh, America uh, but again, if you think of agriculture, every uh, um, every country has different way of uh, uh, you know having agriculture processes, services, uh, different sizes of farms, different companies, different players. So for you to integrate your service in that market, you really need to understand how it works. Uh, and if you come from I don't know Russia, Kazakhstan. India, it's very different from the way it works in the U.S. or the way it works in South America. So, uh, yeah, I would say that, uh, at least in our case, we are more selective in geography. So it means all of you agree that if there is a startup with three co-founders with very good business development uh, experience on board, and they have got one B2B customer, say, for example, in India, in Europe, and America, and and they have attraction for next B2B customers. So if you invest in that startup, would you confine the founders to start focusing only on the US, or would you also promote to go and grow in the other two markets from day one? I'll just give you an example. We have uh, one company that we invested back at Monsanto, and we uh, they, they did uh, weather stations. So initially uh, it was I in the US, then it was South America, and now they're in Europe. But the, the first market we wanted to be here. Um, and this is, y y you know, you still have to prioritize. You cannot do three countries at once if you're early stage company. You need to figure out where you want to be, where the management team is going to be, and then you grow from there. Hello. Okay. Hi. Um, I think it, this is probably sort of a continuation of his question because he was talking about building a truly global company, which I understand when it comes to capital, uh, there's a lot of different countries are still kind of fighting over capital, which is great. Thanks for the panel, I think. Not sure. But <laughs> at the same time, I think, um, would what would you feel? How would you feel as we're kind of in the sort of in the process of consolidating interest globally, uh, be it capital-wise, be it government-wise, be it people-wise, be it technology-wise, and be it science-wise. Do you guys see this going going somewhere, maybe? And maybe one day we'll actually be able to have one truly consolidated interest in that market? And maybe, what do you guys see capital playing in that role? Because I understand everybody has a whole bunch of resources you know, under their belt, and you know they have to serve their specific purposes in the world. So, Do you question? so is, is this <laughs> about Sorry, sort this of the globalization of capital and right. the access? Is that it? So it's about you know we're going to have like truly global markets and you know capital should flow also in a global manner. Yes. Sorry. Um. Yeah. That was that was. About that was your company or about the world? The <laughs> world. Yes. Uh, no. Sorry. That was very much an open-ended question <laughs> and a little bit too broad. Yeah. I should probably narrow it down. Uh, I guess the closest one would be, how would you guys think um, a truly consolidated global interest would work and how would capital fit into that picture? I, I, I think in some ways we are moving a bit away from it. Um, uh, the trade war concerns me because of it. Um, I think China has been its own thing for a very long time and maybe rightfully so. I, I continue saying that the next Silicon Valley is already there. Uh, it's probably Beijing. Um, so, uh, you know, in some ways I'm not sure we are closer to a truly global market. Certainly, from a, m a perspective of access to end users, customers, etc., capital flows a little bit more freely, but also not true. I mean, we have a lot of controls on capital these days in many countries, and some have been inv have been imposed in the last five years. So I don't know. I think m I'm not even sure we're closer to it. I'm, I think we might be actually further away from it, to be honest. You, you know, you've mentioned the, the trade war a couple of times now, so I, I got to ask, and I guess think about Brexit as well. Is that actually having a real impact here in Silicon Valley on your business and what you're investing in? 
Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I, I would completely agree with uh, your point that we're moving away from sort of globalization and we're more into like regionalization, like mega regions, uh, which is, you know, uh, one of the consequences of sort of a, you know, US China equalization as opposed to, you know, US as the n only superpower. <coughs> How it affects, uh, you know, very practically our business. Uh, we've had instances where companies got funding from you know Chinese reputable venture capital firm associated with uh, a US firm signed documents everything fortunately not in our fund but uh, signed documents and then oops the money never gets here uh, a situation like that the company went out of business right even though everything was uh, put together so definitely the you know the trade war the the, the 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 difficulty of transferring capital from particularly China to the US one one big issue the second big issue is ip investments like or or deep tech or <coughs> investments that have a strong sort of ip aspects to them um the the fact that uh, additional regulations like uh, things called cfus you guys may be familiar with which which basically says if you're uh, a us company and you have a potentially chinese acquirer uh, the government the us government may block your your transaction, even though you're you know fairly small company compared to whatever Google or so, uh, be because of, of IP protection, like national interest, and and that I, I I've seen that firsthand. Um, I, I've actually seen it trigger <laughs> the the version of CFIS in China and in Europe. So three regulatory bodies <laughs> trying to block a deal. Uh, we were very very lucky that the deal actually went through, uh, but it took 18 months. I think there is, um, and again, I'm not a macro guy, so I have to be careful in what I say, um, but I think there is a fundamental geopolitical fight between between China and the U.S., right? And it's now, you know, you know heads-on, right? And I think that, uh, that geopolitical war is actually expanding economically across many continents, right? Uh, Africa is a done deal. Um, Southeast Asia, I actually think, is a done deal. Um, South Asia, question, question mark. Uh, Europe, surprisingly enough, is actually still up for grabs, and there's a lot of stuff that's been done in Europe. Uh, South America, the same thing. So I think we're in the middle of this thing that seems very invisible or only manifested through an active political trade war, but this thing's been going on for years now. Um, and uh, and in some ways, the restrictions we're seeing with CFIUS, the restrictions we're seeing in the market are pretty, pretty significant, right? And there will be a counterpunch to this, right? You know, it's not like the other side's gonna say, oh yeah, great. Um, I was actually talking to someone the other day who was saying, actually, they will say great, right? Because there will be more rational agents, right? They will say, please, bring us your money still, right? But um, in some ways, I think that's the, the play we're in the midst. It is actually a very macro play. It, I think, will affect us in terms of sources of capital. It will affect the companies that we invest in. It will affect exit routes for the companies we invest in. It will affect a lot of stuff. Okay. Sorry. But, oh, yes. But do you have any take on that? Because I figure, you know, with your background, and you probably know more about this as well. Just a little bit more. Okay. Just for you. Yes. <laughs> Do I have a take on the globalization of innovation? Consolidating of the consolidation of interests globally. Well, you, when you say consolidation of interests, instead of having countries playing by their own teams, everybody people playing on their own. Together. Together. I mean, I, 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 I'm, I, I totally agree that we're, we're going the wrong way, that we're throwing sand in the gears. You know, we keep throwing sand in the gears. Starting, I don't know what, what you want to say. You started with, but you know, immigration. That's you know huge sand in the gears that has been going on now for almost 20 years. So you know good news, bad news. Great thing about entrepreneurs, the great thing about innovators is they figure out how to get around it. And so what's interesting, I mean, I I think yes, there's going to be all this macro sort of Sturm and Drog and wringing of hands about you know these controversies, but on the ground, on the ground, you know I see entrepreneurs going back and forth to here in China and they're going all over the planet and they're still coming back and forth from Russia and you know uh, entrepreneurs are 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 flowing all over the globe and so fundamentally I am not worried about 
a slowdown in innovation. I'm not worried that somehow this is going to be a drag on our ability to continue to innovate. I think there will be lots and lots and lots of individual transactions with sand in the gear because of immigrations and CFIUS and trades and COCOM, all these things that, that are, are overlays. But I am totally optimistic. You know, for example, the China 2025 thing. God bless, that's the greatest thing that could happen for the world. They're going to pour a ton of money into innovation, and it will leak around the world. Try as they might, it's going to leak around the world, just like all the innovation here leaks around the world. And so, you know, it's, I think it's, it's, it's a great thing. I hate it when I hear people saying, oh, my God, China's investing money in innovation. Isn't that terrible? That's crazy. That's crazy, right? <laughs> So it's, you know, the, the good thing is that the, the world, the world, there's sand in the gears, but the world continues to get smaller and smaller in a lot of other ways. And so the speed with which innovation and ideas transfer just continues to accelerate. And somebody puts a new feature into WeChat, and boom, it's going to be in Facebook Messenger the next week, right? Uh, whatever, right? So, so I think... All of this sort of energy around the geopolitical stuff is important, it's relevant, but I don't think it's going to stop or even significantly harm the grander innovation ecosystem, although individuals are going to suffer if they get caught in the trap. I'll just add quickly. I, I think, you know, as an entrepreneur, you should be very open-minded. Uh, you, you shouldn't, I, I guess there is difference between raising capital and building business uh, in a way um, I'll just give an example I have a friend who learns a lot and he's an entrepreneur and he takes a lot of little things from different countries he goes to and he learns the same business from different people all around the world and when he comes back here it makes his products so much better because he knows all these little secrets here and there he knows the right people and it's a big advantage to him over other people who are innovating in his field um, and the the other thing I think when we talked about capital overall there is definitely a lot of capital today but I feel like sometimes people think because there is a lot of capital it's easy to get you still have to have a business you still have to have something to offer and an entrepreneur by definition is a person who is to the bill's point a very uh entrepreneurial like he or she finds ways to get things done whether it's fundraising, whether it's making the product, whether it's finding the customers. And this is where it's so exciting, right? Like you actually can do something, build something that other people can't. And that's why people willing to give you money because they believe in you, because they see that you can do that uh, and other people can't. All right, we have time for a couple more quick questions and some quick answers. Um, just very quick, uh, do you think that uh, each of you can mention like three industries or uh, yeah, uh, 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 three industries where you will be uh, very interested on in investing in this year or in the next year where you will see like, for example, a cold email pitch deck and you will definitely go for something like that. I am super anti-picking industries. Our best exits have all been in companies that if we had a thesis, we wouldn't have invested in. But our thesis, as, you know, our thesis has always been, let's crowdsource the next big thing. Let's, let's cast the net broadly to see what pops up. Because our thesis is always, if you chase the hot thing, you're going to be too late. So my, my, my recommendation, if you're sort of trying to figure out, ooh, ooh, what's the hot thing that I should be going after, is, you know, depending on what your background is, find, find something that you think you can do better than anyone else, and if it's, but if it's hot, then figure out a way to move to a cooler part of that market. <laughs> do not chase the hot thing. 
So whatever, you know, three or four years ago, if you chased ed tech, you know, everybody was doing ed tech. It was a terrible thing to jump into. Everybody was chasing AR, VR. That was a terrible thing to jump into, right? So don't listen to anybody who says, this is hot. <laughs> I, I, I totally agree. We at, um, at, at Christian Robotics, we're, we're product people. That's our background. We do a lot of consumer work. And so we have themes that we just stand behind, things that we deeply believe in very thematically. And then over time, we generate some thesis around it. They're not really industry thesis. They're more like use case thesis. They're like user flow thesis, jobs to be done thesis. Um, and for us, you know, just naming a few that we look at quite extensively that we really believe in, you know, we think there's going to be a next generation of mobility and mobility like physical mobility. We believe there's going to be a next generation of home. The home is going to be very different from what it is today, both internally and externally or indoor or outdoor, if you want to call it like that. We believe very strongly that there's going to be a next generation of entertainment, think gaming, education, anything around it. Um, we believe there's actually going to be a next generation of retail be it digitally native brands, be it new physical retail points, uh, food tech, and how it actually gets done, etc. And so uh, for us, that's basically what we stand behind. We stand behind these themes, we generate theses around it, and then we don't just write blank checks, right? We actually spend time, figure out, are you really solving a big problem? How does this scale? Is this the right team, the right right product for that for that market you know is there some technology differentiation around it is there some momentum around it etc hello yes there we go have you guys run into any headaches using uh pre-money safe notes in follow-on investments and would you recommend safe notes to early entrepreneurs Oh, uh, um, <laughs> we don't like convertible. We, yeah, so, so, so it, it depends. It's sources for courses. I've done angel investments. I've done super angel investments, and I do micro venture as well. And, and I have a lot more openness to convertible notes and some form of safe notes. Um, and some form is sort of the keyword here or the keywords. Um, as a venture investor, um, classically, in Ed Christian, we don't like it. Um, and, and the reason for that is not that we want to just be in equity on the cap table immediately, but it is, uh, for me, the difference between what I call dating and being married. If you're on the cap table and you have equity, you're married, right? I mean, we really are married. And if anything goes wrong, you know, we're, we're also screwed, right? Whereas I think the dynamics of a note, um, and it, I don't think that's the intention of it. I don't think there's anything wrong with the legal mechanism at all. But it just generates almost this dynamic of dating, and it's a small bet, and we'll see, and whatever, um, which I don't think is actually very conducive to anyone, right? So either we're both all in or we're not. Um, and so that's how I look at it. Again, I do a bunch of convertible notes, safes, etc., as an angel, etc., but my involvement in the company is very different. By the way, for those of you who are wondering what he means by free money, safe notes, or post money, we're actually, ID at IPO is doing a whole session on on splitting up equity, I'm going to be talking quite a bit a lot about that, going through some cap tables and showing where, where the traps are. It's, it's, it's counterintuitive. It's a little tricky. Uh, that's March 19th. Uh, I can just quickly add, I, like on our side, we do, uh, I think for seed rounds, you very often see safe notes or convertible notes. Um, and sometimes you do price seed round, but it depends on certain dynamics. Um, but yeah, uh, I, I think in general, that just how it works in the beginning, and then you just get to Series A and you get a price round. All right, we got time for one last question. Make it a good one. I don't know if it's a good one. Um, you, just to touch on crowdfunding, um, do you recommend it? Um, do you recommend it for a software B2C product? And if you do crowdfunding, should it be before, should it be the very first investment or should it be after some level of investment, uh, after angel, after pre-seed? So consumer B2C, but software only or with hardware? Uh, no, no hardware. No, no hardware. hardware. I, uh, you, you, if you need the capital really badly and do it, 
do it. Otherwise, I mean, the cost of developing consumer software at a very basic level with minimum features is actually not that high unless you're doing something incredible. And if you're doing something incredible, it's probably going to be wrong the first day, right? Because you're probably over featuring it. Um, and that's in and of itself baggage that you need to carry in the product. So How about my, my advice would be no on consumer software. Hardware for sure. We talked about Kickstarter and other stuff. I wouldn't do it as crowdfunding in equity, to be honest. I would just do Kickstarter, Indiegogo, something like that, um, and and not get you know all these messy things then around your your your, your cap table, etc. So, I I think um, that's how I would look at it. If you absolutely need the capital and whatever, and you think you can get it through crowdfunding, go ahead. Um, but uh, but that's normally how I would look at it. Is it also a good way to get some visibility from the market, from your perspective, or? No, it, it, everyone yeah. s talks about that. It's like, oh, yeah, it's great. It's like almost free, free user. It's, it's reverse free user acquisitions because someone's paying me, right, to get, you know, this marketing, whatever. If it blows up, which the odds are very low, then that might happen. But, I mean, consumer software, I think it's incredibly unlikely. I think there are other better mechanisms to generate marketing um, at, at leaner costs to do that. And again, the cost of development shouldn't be ridiculous. So I, I don't know why I would do it. It's, it's, it's a pain in the neck, I think, is basically what I'm saying. Hardware, non-dilutive stuff, for sure. It's a great idea. And I just, you know, just a, a variation on the theme. I'm not sure that we disagree that much, but based, you know, depending on exactly what you're going after and how you're going after it, you know, my attitude is even with consumer software, there's no reason not to try um, uh, crowdfunding for, you know, a Kickstarter, Indiegogo type of crowdfunding. Um, I would, I would, this, so you guys all realize we're not talking about equity crowdfunding, right? Course, talking about, right. So, because it, it's a great, I think Kickstarter is a great forcing mechanism. So you've got to really figure out what messaging works. And so a lot of companies, what they do is they, they say, well, we'll just do free, free downloads. We'll just do free and see how many people download. And then we'll try to get a convert. And you know, getting people to pay for something forces you to, forces you to, to figure out a message that people will respond to. Um, and so if, I, you know, if you came to us and said, here, we got this thing, I would say, why haven't you? tried, you know, Kickstarter to see if people will actually pay you for something. So it's not that expensive. It can get expensive. But um, and if it blows up, if it well, I'm not sure which direction blowing up meant you meant. But if it does really well, God bless. That's phenomenal. Right. You may be cash flow positive before you raise a dime. Um, if it doesn't work out, you've learned something and nobody cares. Nobody's going to say, ooh, they failed. On nobody's going to say that. Right. So. <laughs> I, I uh, in this I would actually disagree. I would say why have you and show me your cohort analysis and your funnel analysis because what I really want to see is your retention engagement on whatever users you have on your on your consumer software app online whatever you're doing. All right, let's give it up for the panel. <laughs> let's hear it for our great moderator, Roger Royce. Once again, let's hear it for our venue, host, One Piece Work, and all our partners and sponsors. Let's hear it for our video team and our event team. Let's hear it for our audience. Let's hear it for our bouncer. And let's hear it for me. So the video will be available on our YouTube channel in three weeks. YouTube.com slash idea to IPO. Check it out. Stick around, network, socialize, and connect. As a courtesy to One Piece work, we'd like to leave the building by 9 p.m. Thanks for coming, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>